This is the LCR, the Little Colorado River, and this is where it meets up with its big brother, the mighty Colorado. Here at the confluence, the bright brown waters of the LCR mix with the cool aqua greens of the main stem Colorado River. This is the start of Grand Canyon and the heart of critical habitat for the endangered humpback chub. The Little Colorado River is really one of the last strongholds for humpback chub on Earth. It's a native fish that was placed on the first federal list of endangered species back in 1967. The Arizona Game and Fish Department has been closely monitoring the status of the humpback chub since 1987. Each spring, researchers descend into the canyon and set up camp along the edge of the Little Colorado River. They'll spend about a month here, catching fish and collecting data for the U.S. Geological Survey's Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center. The USGS funds the research, Game and Fish does the work. I tell you what, this is a, a beautiful location. Grand Canyon's right around the corner. We're in the Little Colorado River area. The water is amazing. The scenery is amazing. Some days it's more amazing than others. For much of the year, the LCR is a stunning turquoise blue. But on days like today, runoff from snowmelt or storms renders the water this brilliant brown. That's how it's always been because the LCR is still a wild, natural river, mostly unregulated by man. But that's not the case with the main stem Colorado River, at least not since the mid-1960s when Glen Canyon Dam was placed in its path. This 710-foot tall concrete structure changed the Colorado River environment. The river is now colder than Mother Nature intended because water released from the dam comes from the depths of Lake Powell. These native fish that adapted to warm water temperatures uh, now are living in a in an area, at least in the main stem Colorado River, where it's much cooler than they're used to. And that can affect their growth, their reproduction, um, and just the ability for them to live. Case in point, the humpback chub. Its population began to plummet after Glen Canyon Dam was built. After organizing camp and strapping right. supplies to their backs, these fish biologists hiked toward the confluence a little over a mile away. During the hike, they stop to collect nets that have been stashed away since last spring. Most are coated with a heavy crust of travertine from months of use in the mineral-rich river. The ones that are in good shape are used again, while worn-out nets are replaced with new ones. The researchers refer to charts and photographs to make sure each net is placed in the same location as it was the year before. There you go. By using standardized methods with setting these hoop nets in the same place from year to year, since 1987, we can look at trends in the population. By the end of the day, they'll set 13 hoop nets in the Little Colorado River, all of them within 1,200 yards of the confluence. We have the rope for net three. They're positioned to take advantage of the spring spawn when fish leave the main stem Colorado to reproduce in the warmer waters of the LCR. What we try to do is we set these nets along the shorelines with the opening on the downstream end so those fish, as they swim upriver, uh, get captured in our gear. Feel it? No. You're stepping oh, wait, on it. I got it. In the remaining hours of daylight, the researchers have a few more nets to set. They take special care to make sure each one is sufficiently anchored so it won't collapse in the current. After the final net sinks to the bottom of the LCR, a tired team returns to camp to get rested and ready for another busy day on the river. What? 
Shortly after sunrise, Robin takes the daily measurements of water temperature and turbidity, or just how murky it is. It's information that can help researchers better understand how river conditions correlate to the amount of fish they catch. There can be differences in our catch rates or our ability to capture these fish depending on the clarity of the water. Turbidity went down, that's good. After breakfast, it's time to start checking the nets. Just try to roll it up right here. Fish. Oh, we got a humpback. Sometimes they're full of fish and sometimes they're not. But that element of surprise got a couple in there. is always exciting. Calm down. There we go. Final sucker. We got a nice big humpback chub here. You can really tell the size of the hump on this. So far, the nets are producing positive results. That'll be one of our, likely one of our larger nets. We just caught flannel mouth suckers, a bluehead sucker, and humpback chub. No matter the species, each native fish captured in these nets goes through the same process. 270. The researchers measure it, check it for parasites, and make note of its sexual characteristics. Sex is undetermined, not right. All of that information is written on log sheets that will become part of an extensive Recap, database yes. nearly 30 years in the making. So these are pit tags. Each fish that's not too small is also injected with a passive integrated transponder if it doesn't have one already. It's about the size of a grain of rice and you can kind of see right here it's relative size to a penny. A pit tag is a small microchip containing a unique number that allows researchers to identify the fish the next time it's captured. 003, Bravo Alpha. When we take the data from this fish, we can go back to our fish database and we're able to know the last time it's been caught and then also where it's moved from. At least alive. Monsters! Net after net, the researchers inventory fish and record their findings. Wow, this is a big fish. This is one of the biggest, oldest humpback chubs I've ever put my hands on. This fish is probably upwards of 20 to 30 years old. Humpback chub can live for 30 to 40 years. So that's pretty exciting to capture a fish of that size, of that age. Doesn't look like there's a tag, we'll place a new one in and to put a new pit tag in that fish, because next time we'll be able to capture that fish and uh, see if it's grown any and see where it's moved. Live to see another day. We'll get some more information on you next time. And there's a pretty good chance there will be a next time Delta if this Delta. year's catch is any Zero indication Zero of three. future success. Bravo Alpha. During the Zero 2013 four. survey, which lasted from April 12th to the 5th of May, these nets snared a total of 2,214 fish 62% of them had been previously captured. There's another, another humpback chub. Looking at the numbers for humpback chub alone, 769 humpback chub were caught and 38% of them were recaptures. So this is a juvenile humpback chub. The more of these that we see each year, in general, the better the population will be in the, in the future. This population of humpback chub that lives in and around the confluence was in pretty sad shape not too long ago. People were getting really scared in the late 90s, early 2000s, and the population seemed to be bottoming out. But the population started to rebound as the Colorado River was getting warmer, the result of a declining water level in Lake Powell that reached a record low in 2005. As of 2013, the humpback chub population remains on the rise. I'm very optimistic. We've seen a substantial increase in the population since the middle of the 2000s. Of course, there's no guarantee that will continue. But by checking these nets every 24 hours for about a month each spring, these researchers are giving wildlife managers the data they need to react to changing trends before it's too late. If we see that the population is in severe decline, then we may need to take management actions to, to find ways to increase the population overall. Scientists believe the humpback chub has lived in the waters that carve these canyons for millions of years. 
And with any luck, this long-term research project will help it survive for many years to come. It's kind of like an insurance policy on the future of a fish. Can't ask for a better day of fishing.